coast of England begins one of the most remarkable stories of the war. It is the story of the creation of the artificial harbors in Normandy. The strange structures which you see here helped to make possible the invasion of Western France. They enabled us to land six armies across open storm-swept beaches and to supply our armies when the Germans wrecked the French ports. These huge hollow blocks of reinforced concrete are called phoenixes. Each phoenix is 200 feet long, 60 feet high, 40 feet thick, and weighs 6,000 tons. More than 100 phoenixes were built in England to be towed across the channel to form breakwaters. This device is a Lobnitz pierhead. These 80-foot bridge sections are called whales. When the whales are assembled, they form a continuous bridge, like this practice assembly put together by the sea bees in the British Isles. The Lobnitz pierheads at the end of the floating bridge, anchored and guided by giant legs or spuds at their four corners, are lowered and raised to meet tidal changes. Each pierhead has its own power plant and switchboard for spud operation. Captain Clark was in charge of the artificial harbor at Omaha Beach, and Commander Collier of the 108th CB Battalion was in charge of installing the Phoenixes, pierheads, and bridging. This was the greatest towing operation in history. Many of the invasion ships towed sections of the harbor installations. The tows were made ready on D-2. More than 300 tugs were used. One tug was assigned to each Phoenix, Whale, or Lobnitz Pier. The bridge sections, or whales, floated on special pontoons called beetles. Some of the beetles were made of steel, others of concrete. Steel beetles were to be used on inboard sections which would dry out at low tide. Each whale had a towing crew of six sea bees. Here a tug is preparing to tow a phoenix. The round concrete clumps on each side of the phoenix are sea anchors to be used in case the phoenix might break loose from the tug. Special mooring bridles were developed which included shock absorbers to ease the strain on tug and phoenix. Long whales crawled like serpents across the channel. Constant vigilance was required to detect any indication of weakness in the units or their connections during the towing operations. While the tows were light, slow speeds had to be maintained to avoid overstressing the connections. Note the spuds at the corners of the Lobnitz pierheads. A dumb barge. Many of these, loaded with ammunition and rations, were towed over and rammed high and dry onto the beach, where they could be unloaded as desired, acting somewhat in the capacity of warehouses. Our planes blanketed the towing lanes, in addition to the surface warcraft, which convoyed all tows. Each Phoenix carried a six-man CV towing crew and a 12-man Army gun crew. The gun is a 40-millimeter AA. Glider troops passed over the convoy at H minus two hours. A Corvette, part of the escorting force, which accompanied all cross-channel tows. To create the artificial harbor, we began by sinking the phoenixes in the form of an L-shaped breakwater off Omaha Beach. 
Beyond the Phoenix's steel floats called Bomberdons were moored to reduce surface wave action and provide anchorage areas for deep draft vessels. Inside the harbor, the 3,000-foot bridges were assembled, running out to the floating Lobnitz pierheads. The 2,100-foot sunken causeways afforded dry, firm surfaces for landing at any tidal stage of both men and equipment and provided continual service round the clock. The secondary breakwater was composed of a line of sunken ships and provided a haven for small craft as well as shelter for the Rhino repair barges. The lateral tide range was 2,000 feet. This meant that at low tide, 2,000 feet of the bridges were resting on sand and 2,000 feet of the causeways were exposed. Steel beetles were used to support the sections of bridging across the dried out beach. The first tows began arriving at Omaha on the morning of D-Day. The concentration of shipping off Omaha in the early stages of the assault was enormous. Obstacles, constant gunfire, floating and moored mines of the enemy, as well as the disturbed sea condition made safe handling of these craft most difficult. Collisions or stranding were negligible. As the Phoenixes arrived, they were carefully jockeyed into position. Each Phoenix was simply a floating section of a seawall, and the problem was to sink the Phoenixes so as to form an effective barrier against the fierce channel waves. Each Phoenix had to be sunk in position to proper grade and alignment. Before any sinking operations were begun, even in the training period, scale models had been sunk in testing basins, where several peculiar characteristics were observed, which proved invaluable in handling the actual phoenixes, characteristics which could not be foretold or anticipated. Without knowledge of these characteristics, serious results may have attended our early sinking operations. Each phoenix had 10 compartments, which were flooded to sink the phoenix into position. The trim, list, and rate of sinking was controlled by manipulating valves and regulating the flooding of each compartment independently of the others. Crews became very expert in handling and sinking the caissons. Naturally, there was some movement of the caissons due to shifting and settlement, inasmuch as they were placed on an unprepared foundation. And to this extent, the top elevation of the assembled breakwater was irregular. The onshore end of the first bridge was secured at high tide on D plus three. Then, at each subsequent high tide, additional sections were added. This process was repeated until the regular length was in place. When the first bridge was completed to a full length of 3,000 feet, the Lobnitz pierheads were moved into position, and the connections between the bridging and pierhead were made. Spuds were lowered into final position, and from thence onward, the only movement of the pierhead was to be vertically up and down on the spuds as the tide would rise and fall. The first bridge was completed on D plus 11 and immediately placed in service. All types of vehicles passed across the bridging without the slightest mishap or delay. The bridging gracefully conformed to the surface movement of the water without hindrance to vehicular operation. Admiral Kirk inspected the assembly. The first LST docked on D plus 11. The piers were designed to handle both LSTs and coastal freighters, but there was not enough water alongside for Liberty ships. Special ramps for accommodation of LSTs were an integral part of the Lobnitz pierhead structures. These ramps could be adjusted to meet draft conditions of the LST and permitted the transfer of equipment under its own power direct from the LST to shore via pierhead and bridging. On June 17th, the harbor was almost complete at Omaha, 
three days ahead of schedule. In addition to sinking the Phoenixes, 13 block ships were sunk at Omaha. They were sunk in line, just as the Phoenixes were sunk. They helped reduce wave action and provided shelter for landing craft. Each ship was jockeyed into position by regular Navy crews and sunk by exploding charges placed in the ship's hold. The Centurion, a veteran of the last war, having fought at Jutland, found herself outmoded for active duty in this war, and this was her final contribution to the cause. On shore at Omaha, the Seabees established and operated the Navy camp. Reinforced foxholes were standard quarters, and mines were a persistent problem and an ever-present danger. Frequent night air raids made the protection provided by the foxholes welcome even though they provided little or none of the comforts of home. Commander Jardine of the 111th Battalion commanded Rhino ferries and CB shore activities at Omaha. Even though chow was then and had been for days only K rations, the chow call brought enthusiastic response. Plug hats were not uncommon among GIs sort of a last fling attitude. Then the storm struck. It came on June 18th, almost without warning. Not in 20 years had such a storm hit the channel in June. No possible interpretation of meteorological records could have predicted the possibility of such a storm at this time of the year. In intensity, direction, and duration, it violated all precedents. 252 craft were piled onto the beach in a tangled, confused mass, breathing defiance at would-be salvagers. For three days, the fierce onshore winds had beaten at our installations, and we were unable to land a single pound of supplies. This at a critical period when supplies should be rolling at a maximum rate. When urgently needed critical items just had to be provided, coasters were driven ashore and unloaded through the surf at great hazard. The CB repair barges proved a godsend after the storm. They too had been towed across the channel. Operations on the repair barge never ceased. Day and night this activity continued. No job was too big or too small. No questions were asked. All jobs were done as received. No atheists in foxholes, no favorites at the repair barge. A second artificial harbor had been created by the British at Aeromanche. This beach, miles to the eastward of the American beach, had natural protection, which was totally missing at the American beach. The units making up the artificial harbors were identical at each beach. By reason of its orientation and number of units in place, it was not so badly damaged by the storm. These views were made after the storm when the harbor was running normally. These are the Lobnitz pierheads at Aramash, almost a mile offshore from the high tide mark. The ships are coasters. Reinforced by equipment salvaged from Omaha, this harbor was handling large tonnages of cargo. This is a Rhino ferry taking cargo from a Liberty ship. 32 Rhinos were used on Utah and Omaha. All of them were built and operated by the Seabees. After we began grounding LSTs on the two American beaches, the rhinos were used exclusively as lighters for the Liberty ships. Beginning with D-Day, the rhinos have been in continuous operation. Battered by storms and hard usage, 
they are readily repaired and restored to duty. They are a patient, long-suffering beast of burden with no ambitions beyond continuous operation. Each rhino carries an average of 80 vehicles per trip from ship to shore. One rhino can discharge the full load of an LST in two trips. The two outboard engines on the rhino propel the big barges at a speed of about three knots. Waders and bulldozers met the rhinos at the beach. The problem with the rhinos was to prevent their drying out at the beach. If a rhino dried out, it was out of operation for at least six hours because of the recedence of the tide leaving the rhino high and dry. Unloading at causeways avoided this necessity for drying out. rhino control post on the beach. Bulldozers were used to help the rhino retract. The time has come when the bulldozer also can be classed as an amphibious unit. The Navy's famous 1006 pontoon detachment handled the causeways on both Omaha and Utah beaches. The flat beaches required an entirely new causeway technique. Instead of allowing the causeways to float, as we did at Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio, we sank the causeways to their entire length of 2,100 feet. Here, the CBs of 1006 are bringing the causeway sections in at high tide and sinking them. Speed of placing and readiness for use is one of the great advantages of the pontoon causeways. All forms of landing craft up to LCTs use the causeways. Vehicles which had not been waterproofed could be delivered dry to the beach over the causeways. At Utah Beach, the 81st CB Battalion operated Rhino ferries and established the Navy camp for all Navy personnel. As at Omaha, the camp became a transient home for thousands of GIs. Commander Jack Greenewalt of Chicago, shown here in his captured German car, was in charge of the CBs at Utah, arriving on D-Day. Commander Hollis, executive officer of the 81st, is at left, and Dr. Anderson, battalion physician. The camp at Utah was more reinforced foxholes. These foxholes were improved daily and much ingenuity was exhibited in the manner of providing so-called personal comforts. And even here, good old Navy chow was to be had. They uh, call it spam. At Cherbourg, the 28th CB Battalion handled naval construction and repair. This is the main pier with the wrecked railroad station, accomplished by exploding railroad cars loaded with TNT. French Line dock. Here the Normandy docked in peacetime, and here passengers entrained for Paris, the scene of many happy occasions, which, through the fortunes of war, will never be exactly duplicated again. <laughs> 
a German chart of the harbor at Cherbourg. Possible points of attack were zeroed for the coastal guns. This German hospital in Cherbourg was reconditioned by the 28th Battalion. Many of our wounded paratroopers found treatment in this hospital, now a modern and up-to-date institution in all respects. Le Place Napoléon. The statue of Napoleon was a casualty of the street fighting, a rifle bullet having pierced his left boot. This was naval headquarters. Dr. Anderson of the 81st Battalion was the first American doctor to deliver a French baby. To express their gratitude, the French family named the baby CB. Here, Dr. Anderson visits the family to check up on little CB. The official birth certificate records the baby's name, Sebe Pula Fusha. The CBs are not content with delivering the goods, they also deliver the babies. <laughs> 